Hi, I'm Steve Van Meter. Welcome to your Wednesday night premiere. It's being pre-recorded where we spend about 15 minutes every Monday and Wednesday night and try to answer some important questions on what's going on with the economy, what's going on with the markets. Our question tonight is, is this rally in, in equity sustainable? And the reason I, I asked that question is very simple. And, and unfortunately, I I saw a chart floating around the internet and uh, I didn't save it. But anyways, the global factory surveys are about as bad as they were in 2009. I mean, economic data is falling. I mean, Germany is, pr is pretty much in a recession. And yet U.S. stocks are sitting right off their all-time highs back where they were literally in January of 2018. So if you bought stocks back in 2018, January 2018, you're no real better off than you were then. But yet there seems to be this big bullish sentiment. Stocks are going higher, 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 and forever higher. The question is, is this sustainable? Well, I don't think so. The content of this video is provided as education and information only. It's not intended to provide investment or other advice. It's channel is not to be construed as a recommendation or solicitation by selling security, financial product, instrument, or participate in any tra particular trading strategy. This video was prepared by Steve Van Meer on purpose. Ah, personal capacity, opinions expressed via that alone do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Stephen Van Meter Financial. Well, let's look at the first amount of evidence. In the uh, corporate share buyback blackout period, we've now moved from here to here. And by Friday, we'll be uh, right here where 40% of the companies buying their stock back are now blacked out. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be at 80%. So there's your first amount of evidence is these companies that are buying their stock back, well, they need to keep buying their stock back because without them buying their stock, well, there's really no buyers. When we look at the trading volume of the market, it's really weak. In fact, we can go take a look at that real quick now. And here's the largest S&P 500 ETF. And on yesterday, on Tuesday, the trading volume was so low, it was the lowest level in like over a year. I mean, virtually hardly any shares traded hands. And you see today it was a little higher, but if we go back out two years, you can see here it was yesterday, this little bar here, there's only a couple of points lower. I mean, these are holidays for the most part. So trading volume is really weak because the largest buyer of stocks is going into blackout. The second issue you have is first quarter earnings. The market is not just priced for perfection, it is beyond perfection. So corporate earnings have to come back up to, to validate stock prices, and I don't think they are. I mean, we've seen early warnings from FedEx and other companies that are saying, no, the market's not as good, or the stock prices are way too high for based on what we have in terms of revenue growth and outlook for the coming quarters. So that's a big concern. But it seems to be, it's just strange that people are so excited about stocks rising on low volume. And all that means is, it's like going to a car dealership. If you're familiar with dealer markup, you have you know the MSRP sticker and on there, you know some dealers, not too unusual around Bakersfield, but it will say dealer markup or you know uh, region markup. In a sense, it's, hey, we're, we're just gonna charge you over sticker and if you're dumb enough to pay it, well, that's your problem. Now, in the real world, if I went down and paid over sticker for just some run-of-the-mill car, people would make fun of me. But I would hope that they would go down later and pay even more than I did so I could be make fun of them. But in reality, in the stock market world, if I pay more and then you pay more and the next person after you pays even more because these computer algorithms called high frequency traders are just keep marking up the price and people get so excited to pay it that it doesn't make any sense. All people are doing is just paying too much for something and yet they're happy about it. It's odd. Normally you wanna buy low and sell high, but today people want to buy high because they think it's going higher. And anytime you, you make an investment, whether it's stocks, real estate, could be you know coins, stamps, it doesn't matter. You want to look at what your upside potential is and your downside risk is. It's pretty hard pressed right now to look at the market and stock price and say, wow, my upside potential is so big that it offsets any potential downside moves. In fact, I'd argue it's just the opposite because stock prices have not budged for 15 months. Again, they're right where they were 15 months ago. So the risk is to the downside, not the upside. So anyone wanting to jump in now has to really expect that stocks have, have got to go up, say, 50% to offset the potential 20% or more decline that would be priced into your normal recession.
So that's kind of where we stand with that. Um, now, I, I told you, uh, if you watch the update on Monday, that there's a couple charts I wanted to show you. And so let's take a look at one. This is the money supply chart. So going back to 1981, what I've done is I've pulled the M2 money supply. This is right off the Federal Reserve uh, database of website. And if we go down to 2019, I've got three columns, the year over year, the six month growth and the three month growth. And these are pretty important. So the, the three month rate of change, I'm sorry, the 12 month rate of change is at 4.04%. So what's telling us is the money supply is growing at 4.04. Its long-term average is about say six and a half percent. So we're running about a third below where we normally are. But the six month and three month rate of change give us a prediction of what's going on. And you can see the three month rate of change just a week ago was validating the 4% annualized growth because you take this number, multiply it by four, because this is the three month rate of growth and you get to four and you say, yeah, that's pretty valid. And then last week, this dropped in half, which is saying that the, the three month rate of change is predicting the annual rate is gonna drop in half to 2% because you multiply say 0.5% times four, you get 2%. The three month or the six month rate of change comes in at three and a half percent. So it's validating the downward move in the three month, which is saying the 12 months is going to fall. So what does that look like from a graph? And I made one. And what we can see is in, in gray here is the three month rate of change is going down. And every time the three month rate of change falls, you can see the six month rate of change and then the year over year rate of change falls. And so this is very, very dangerous because this is predicting, if this continues to slide, and it should, that the money supply growth is going to out, outright contract. And in fact, on a monthly basis, you can see it went from uh, 14 probably billion, I, I don't know, it could be trillion, who knows what this number, the full number is, but you can see it went from 14,500 uh, down to 14,488. So it already contracted, which is pretty unusual you don't normally see the money supply contract. We saw it kind of looks like it peaked somewhere right here in January and it kind of went down and it came back up. But the growth rate here on the three month rate of change is telling us that bad things continue to come for the money supply because when the year over year rate of change gets under 3.7%, which this is now predicting it will, you have nothing but recessions and depressions. So the question being is, is this move in stock prices valid from a money supply growth rate? No. Now, there's a lot of people say, oh, the money supply doesn't matter. You know, I mean, well, yeah, it, it does. Because if you, how do stock prices go up? I pay more than you did. And then maybe you come back around and pay more than I did. And I come back around and pay more than you did. And, and that drives prices up. But if I have less money and you have less money because the economy is creating less money and not just creating less money, it's creating a below average much, well, right now, a uh, two thirds of its historical average. That means there's just less money for everybody floating around. And how do you get a higher stock prices if people have less money? You don't. That's why housing prices are starting to fall. That's why other asset prices are falling is because there just isn't enough money created, being created. And we can clearly see in the data that is insufficient. And it'd be really interesting because the money supply data is updated tomorrow afternoon. And my guess is it's going to show an even worse number, but we'll see, you never know. All right, the other chart I wanted to show you is the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Now this is something that I kind of made up on my own and, and tracked it, and it's not uh, exactly accurate. I haven't uh, modified this for the full change that's coming from the Fed. I'll update it when it matters. Now I thought there was a 14 month lag. And you see right here, I write 14 month lag. I didn't update this between uh, editing or uh, shooting the video. I just pulled this up. This is what my notes were of when things happened, when they did. And if I was right on the 14 month lag, and I may be wrong. I mean, when it comes to uh, things like monetary lags, nobody really knows for sure. It's all really good guesses. And I based mine on the peak of the of foreign stock markets, like in China and other markets, and said, that's kind of the triggering point. It could be wrong. Some other experts say it's really 18 months. So let's go see where 18 months takes us. And uh, here we go. So we'll start with March. Where are we? Down here. So, because we're going into April. And what's really cool is you can go down here and see it says count 18. So I've counted up 18. 
And now, if, if the 18-month lag is correct, starting in April, we enter the 18-month lag of quantitative tightening because this is where the Fed began, where Janet Yellen began uh, unwinding the balance sheet out of a mere $10 billion per month. So that is interesting. So even if I'm wrong on the 14-month lag, it doesn't really matter because those who are predicting the 18-month lag, which is a fair more, I, at the moment, just two other people that I've uh, run into. So that's still, you know, more than me. Uh, but anyways, if the 18th month lag is right, we're now entering this quantitative tightening period and soon more quantitative tightening with higher interest rates. All that to say is the economic lag start to kick in and the economic data looks weak. And is there some validation to that? Yeah, we'll look at you know the unemployment data, the retail sales data. None of this stuff is just rebounded back really strongly. So it tells us uh, that there are fundamental problems going on here. So let me clear off these spreadsheets and let's kick over to uh, some charts. We've got about four minutes left. So we've already looked at the volume on the largest S&P 500 index. As of today, the broad S&P 500 um, cr just crossed its nose over this resistance channel. It, it call was called gapped up in overnight trading due to the uh, report from Financial Times is who knows uh, the accuracy of it, but anything to get stock prices higher. And today it traded lower in pretty much uh, the lines of 28.72 and it closed at 28.73. So we'll just say right on the line. We still look like a head, our left shoulder head, right shoulder pattern here. And with 40% of the companies now blacked out and more to come, you can kind of guess where the downside risk to this market is. Let's take a look at uh, 10 year treasury yields. These are kind of backed up a little bit, and this isn't really a big deal. And I wanted to show you uh, why it's not that big of a deal. And we'll zoom this so we can see it. So you have to go back and look at where things have traded in the past to see what they might do. So if you look at 10-year treasury yields, they came down to the support level of 2.324, and they bounced off it, revisited again, bounced off it, visited again, and that's kind of where I got this line from was this is showing a support. Now prices or yields did not get down to 2.324%. They got down to uh, looks like 2.39 roughly and they bounced up. But look at where the bounce up is kind of stopped just a little over two and a half percent. And if we go over here, you can see it stopped right around, you know, two and a half percent, a little over two and a half percent. So this, this is support I'm sorry, resistance is right in here. And all it's done is gone back up there. And you can imagine the next move, it could go up here to 2.6. It wouldn't be a huge surprise. I doubt it because, again, large commercial banks are buying. And based on the most recent uh, data from uh, central banks uh, on foreign holdings of central or uh, major foreign holdings, uh, uh, foreign investors have bought a little bit. So again, we're just seeing markets are coming back up here to a little bit of resistance. I drew the dotted line here based on this point, but you could draw a zone, you know, somewhere. I mean, if I copied this and said here, I mean, you've got a little band here, but let's not cloud the picture. So the downside move here means it gets rejected here. It's going to re come down here and retest its support zone and then should have a larger move lower. Uh, from there. All right, so we've got about 90 seconds left. Let's see what else is of interest to me. Oil and gas producers today, the EIA posted a big crude oil gain of uh, 7 million barrels. And let's look at what crude oil did. Virtually ignored it. So the market pretty much discounted that crude oil build and said, nah, we don't think it's legit. But oil and gas producing stocks, they did. In fact, they closed, uh, looks like right under their... 50-day moving average after crashing through their 100-day moving average. This is support in this purple channel right here. And a retest of December lows is down there. Again, this is setting up a move lower in stocks. And if you don't believe me, if we do a comparison between the oil and gas uh, stocks and the broad market, we can zoom out a little bit. You can see they run pretty much uh, together. And, you know, well, not this is really distorted, but in the short scheme of things they've kind of run together and you can see that the s p 500 has risen and oil and gas producing stocks have gone flat and it tells us based on this the s p 500 should be closer to 2500 than to 2800 with downside move to go so when you see the sideways trading 
after a, uh, a little V bottom here is a continuation pattern. So the reason it's not rising because there's still people selling into all of this buying and that means there is a move down to go. So the big money sells into uh, the retail investors. So uh, that'll be a qu our quick little update for Wednesday. And of course, we'll be uh, back on Friday for our longer weekly economic update. So I hope to see you then. And remember, you can't have economic growth on weak money, supp uh, money supply growth. Just never in history has it ever worked. I'm Steve Admeter. Bye now.